there's a lot of people, and yourself included probably 10, 15 years ago, whatever, who have a lot of trouble accessing their feelings, mm -hmm. you know? And so don't take it for granted that just because you're a writer that, oh, everyone else must be able to be, must be able to do this. Like if wow. you can do it, you're giving people a gift because a lot of people cannot do it. They cannot mm -hmm. go there. They don't want, it's too painful. There's something going on. They don't, they'd rather not. You're listening to Screenwriters Need to Hear This with Michael Jen. Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Michael Jammin, and I'm here with Phil, Miracle on the Hudson. Phil, say <laughs> That's hi. That's me. Hi, guys. <laughs> there he is. So today we're talking about writing a smart show, which no one's ever accused me of. That's not true. Sometimes people say I write smart shows. But I, I want to talk about what that means a little bit, because um, it's kind of not as hard as you might think it is, <laughs> Being uh, ironically, Phil. Um, well, it seems pretty hard to me, so I'm excited. It to seems feel hard. You, well, it, you know, so, okay, just talking from our experience. So we ran a show called Glenn Martin DDS, which was like a big goofy cartoon. It was a stop motion animation. It was on Nick at Night. So it was not really, a, uh, you know, it wasn't, it's not HBO. So no one ever accused us of being a smart show. Although I think the writing was pretty smart. Actually, I think the writing was, um, the jokes were pretty cutting I, I kind of think it was a smart show, but no one ever accused us of being of it being a smart show because it was kind of goofy and characters got their heads blown up and, you know, it was claymation. So you're not going to get an, an Emmy for that. Um, but then afterwards, a couple years later, we did a show. We ran Marin and Marin was on IFC. It was like a boutique network. And, every, and it was not a lot of jokes. It wasn't very joke heavy. And everyone's like, the, the critics were like, this is a smart show. And I was like, well, I wonder why they think this is a smart show when we don't really have to work on jokes. Like, you know, we, we never even tried to make it jokey, so we wouldn't spend time punching it up. And, and yeah, and it, I think it was smart. And what was, but the reason why people thought it was smart was like, I just remember the first, the first draft we turned into the network. It was, we wrote it as if we were kind of writing a network show. And this was for IFC and their cable, right? So, the, and they were not really, they liked to go, yeah, but, the ending feels a little neat. And we're like, yeah, good. It means we work really hard to make it feel neat. Because when you want right. to make things neat, you got to wrap it up. You got to wrap it up in a bow, you know? And that's hard. It takes, it takes work. And they didn't like that. They were like, yeah, but we want things messy. And I was like, you do? And so we came up with messy endings after that. And it was so much easier to write because you didn't have to... They thought it was smarter because in real life, things don't end up in a bow. It didn't seem very networky to them. And so they were happy because they thought it was smarter and we were happy because we didn't have to work as hard coming up with these neat endings, hmm. you know? And so I, I just thought, you know, I got more I want to talk about it again, about what, what makes smart. And I just thought that, to me, that was an interesting lesson. Like, oh, that's what smart is. Smart means not wrapping things up in a bow. And when you think about like after school specials or you think about, uh, you know, this children programming or kids or even family programming, everything's always wrapped up in a bow. Everything's always neat. And, you know, and, and it's hard to write that. It takes time. But if you leave it more open-ended at the end, people accuse you of being smart. Hmm. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah, no kidding. Well, okay. So I just, a couple thoughts that came to me while we were diving into that. What would you define as um, neat and clean? Like, how would you define that to say I'm a brand new writer? What, what is a clean ending? Well, it's always like someone learns a lesson at the end. People come to, uh, I, or someone makes a mistake and I apologize and, oh, I accept your apology. Okay, see, everything's okay. We walk off the screen, you know, set and arm in arm and see, everything's, order has been restored. That, yeah. And you'll see that a lot on network sitcoms where, you know, and then of course the next episode, we go back to the same old hijinks. Uh, but in real life, life is messy and character or people don't really learn lessons people don't they might grow a little bit but not a ton and you know and you leave a pe person in a worse place sometimes you'll leave characters at the end of that episode in a worse place than they were than they started and that kind of sometimes people think is smart and i'm like okay i like that god that's what smart is i guess one note you, you know. gave me a long time ago is that in a comedy your character can't learn because that's what makes it funny yeah. Would yeah. you say that that in comedy specifically, it plays deeper into that? Well, yeah, I mean, comedies, the, the characters will learn at the end, but they always reset at the end of the next, the, the start of the next episode because 
you can't change the character. The character has to be the same stupid idiot who makes these same mistakes. So they don't really grow that much. But like, I'm just talking, well, I guess Marin was really, a, it was a dark comedy. And so he wouldn't really, the character wouldn't, wouldn't go to a higher place. He would just, you know, some, he might learn something at the end, but it might necess- not necessarily in a good way or uh, he didn't learn a lesson. He's just in a different emotional state than he was at the beginning of the episode. Yes. And so I think that makes things smarter. Another way I talk about, I think, to think about what smart is, is um, show versus tell. Yeah, I've got that written down on my notes here, actually. Like, oh, what's good. the difference You're between ahead. show and tell? So let's, let's dive into that. You know, when you, any, any kind of writing class you take, even if it's creative writing and not screenwriting, the, your your teacher should tell you show don't tell so you don't show someone um, uh, uh, you don't say or you don't yeah, you don't tell you don't say you don't have a character say I'm jealous of you because you got the the boy that I wanted you would have the character act jealous and the, she would never say I'm jealous she would just act jealous by being a jerk in a, at a scene or whatever and so that's show versus tell telling is when you when the character tells how how they're feeling when we wrote on Marin uh, I'm sorry on, on Glenn Martin. We used to, we used to uh, tell a lot uh, just for comedy's sake because it, so, it was such a bad way of writing. So the character, <laughs> like I remember there's a character who's a 13 year old boy and, uh, and he would tell his feelings. So he would say, we did an episode where he was, they were visiting the White House and he goes down to the basement and he becomes friends with Dick Cheney, who turns out to be a vampire who's been living in the whitest basement for 300 years, <laughs> calling the shots or whatever. <laughs> and so and so that was and so Dick Cheney befriends the character or the character uh, Connor. And uh, and so like the first episode they meet and this, uh, the first scene they meet and the second scene, Connor yells out, oh, strange old man who pays attention to me when no one else does. Are you here? And so like that's when you're telling like that's terrible writing, but it's funny because it's so bad. Um, so, but if that's, that's probably not why, that's probably why no one ever accused that show of being smart, but it was funny. Um, but, but when you're writing other shows, it's so interesting how, how things have changed now, you know, cause people watch shows like 10 years ago, they'd watch a show or a movie and they'd give it their undivided attention. But now when you watch shows, you got your phone in your hand mm-hmm. and you're on TikTok at the same time as you're watching a show and you're, you're barely t- paying attention. So and your wife's squawking in your ear saying you're not paying attention to me. Yeah, yeah and saying. everyone's yelling at you. Yeah. Um, and so I, more often than not, my partner and I, we find ourselves showing and telling because we know people are not really watching TV the way they used to. You know, they're not really paying attention. So you'd kind of show the problem, then you'd kind of tell the problem again, whisper it again, because, for hey, you're not really paying attention. Uh but that wouldn't be exactly smart writing. Telling the problem mm. re- uh, really isn't smart writing. I think letting people, letting people do that work, letting the audience do the work for themselves uh, makes them feel smart. Makes them feel like, oh, I figured it out, as opposed yeah. to being spoon-fed. Then that's not... So that's why I feel it's so interesting that what smart is. Smart is actually, you break the story the same way, but smart means let the audience do a little bit more of the heavy lifting. Let them do more of the work. Because that way they're more engaged in the story. Right. Now, in the past, with like a network show, they were hoping for syndication. I think my assumption is they would tie it up in this bow and make it neat so that anyone could jump in at any point in any episode and you're in the world yeah. again and you're starting a new set of problems. Whereas yeah. if you were to watch something, you know, there's this great book I've talked a lot about um, recently called um, Difficult Men, and I apologize, I can't remember the name of the author, but I'll put it down. But it talks about showrunners and specifically men who created some of the most iconic shows that people Mm -hmm. love, you know, Hill Street Blues back in the day, The Wire, Sopranos, Deadwood, kind of going off. And that's one of the things that, um, you know, they talk about is you can't interrupt. What made these is that they're, they're serialized. Like you're not... Mm-hmm. You're not right. diving into what each episode is its own unique world. It's you need to have seen the previous one to understand that. Mm. And so I think that's where we can kind of get away with that neat, smart writing, because the assumption is I'm binging this on Netflix. I'm watching the entire yeah. season and I'm able to mm-hmm. understand the nuances of like, oh, you remember two hours ago when in episode one, when this guy did yeah. that? Well, that's that pays off here. And in film school, that's one of the things that I thought was a helpful. One of the few helpful notes I got was um 
you know, you want to make your audience feel smart. And so that's where plant and payoff come in. You need to plant mm-hmm. and act one and pay it off so that right. your audience is like, ah, I remember I told you that thing. Oh, that's going to be important. Right. 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 But it's, it's, that's exactly right. How much of that are you leaning into and trusting your audience to be smart though? Because there are a lot of dumb people who watch TV is my experience. We, my wife and I were watching the, the great, which I think is a very smart, smartly written show. Uh, Catherine the Great, and it's very tongue-in-cheek. It's not really historical or anything, but it, it's you know loosely, very loosely based on her life. And there's a scene in it where the Turkish uh, government gives her a gift, like a box, and full of you know we don't know what it's full of, it's, and very expensive. And she, oh, thank you, this is wonderful. And then that's the end of the scene. And I go, oh, and I said to Cynthia, my wife, I was like, oh, watch that'll that'll come back later because there's no you don't put something. You don't set something up without paying it off later, and it turns right. out the box was full of, turns out it was full of poison, and, and had she opened it, it would have killed her. But it's like you don't, yeah, you, every, everything in a script is there for a reason. You don't put something in there without paying it off later. Yeah. So, yeah, um, we had a beautiful, beautiful conversation about that on a, I think a previous podcast where we use that as an okay. example to talk about mise en scène and mise en scène and uh-huh. how every detail matters. And that takes me back to you know one of the shows that I was. It's funny enough, I was talking to this guy, Kevin, from your course, who, um, you know, congratulations, Kevin, just got bumped to be a script coordinator, script coordinator uh, from being a PA which and an assistant, which is awesome. Um, gave a lot of praise to you in your course, by the way, for the quality of his writing improving to the point where they trusted him to give him that bump. Um, yeah, it was nice. He uh, he sent me a nice thank you letter, and it was nice to him. Yeah, we, we, got, we had a really good conversation. One of the things he talked about was um, how... Every single character matters and every piece of detail matters. And, and I brought up that example of you used of Marin and your set decorator, your you know, art director who put mm-hmm. in those blurry images throughout the whole thing and how exciting it was about film. And then he started talking about like characters and how characters are important. You shouldn't just have guard number one and guard number two. Every single one of those characters should be a person and you should understand who they are because they play that plays into the film why, why else are they there and if they don't serve mm-hmm. some deeper purpose why do they matter and that busted me over to um you know right after we got off that call i went over and my <coughs> my wife and my mother-in-law were gone and so i started watching die hard which was part of my christmas you know tradition mm-hmm. and that's something i noticed and i i started really diving into it like that's probably why that film is so good just because every single character has its own backstory like every single one of them um, mm. the bad guys two of the bad guys are brothers which pays off one of the reasons why one of the bad guys really wants to kill, kill John McClane so so deeply um, the chauffeur it's his first day driving and he's totally acting mm. like it's his first day he's like arguing with the customer and like you know doing all these things and it's just this beautiful bit of information that that builds to something and yeah. you getting we the nuance that. yeah when we write, we'll say like, well, "How can we plus this character?" Like, how you know? Okay, here's the bad version we throw up in the first draft or whatever, an outline or whatever. But then we start writing, we start digging in. It's like, okay, well, how can we make this just a little bit better? You know, because those yeah. little things add up. So. Yeah, and we I just witnessed that too on set of this uh, Broken Lizard film that I was just working on. They had characters that were that you know kind of guard number one, and then based mm-hmm. on the person they cast to play that <clears throat> role, they would lean into that actor's experience and skill sets to make it very funny. Some of the most memorable yeah. film moments I think in this film are going to be from some of these side characters, just like you said, plussing it and leveling it up. And we might say, so. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's interesting. Um, I was, I was going to say was... too, that part of that conversation kind of led to how we kind of got deep into, you know, what kind of really inspired me to be a writer again. And it was, you know, I remember one night with some friends, we watched, the movie saw and i'm not a very big horror gore fan but mm. if you haven't seen saw i mean there's this huge psychological like twist at the end that blew my mind and then the same night we watched donnie darko the director's edition which blew my mind and it kind of opened up my mind and then shortly thereafter lost came out and lost was like the hit of the you know 2004 five six era and I remember watching season one. I was like, man, eh, it's, you know, it's okay. And I was kind of guessing what was going on. And then at the end of season one, like this thing happens. And I'm just like, I had no idea that was going to happen. And it hooked me so deep. But going mm-hmm. back years later, kind of rewatching it, getting ready for the finale. And you start noticing things like, oh, all of the characters' names have to deal with the different philosophers. And they're reading books about time travel mm-hmm. in the first episode. 
And it's like all of these little details. And yeah. you might say, well, they didn't know where they were going, which is fair. I mean, it's went six, seven seasons, but they knew enough to understand the theme of the story. So they were able to embed and plant those things that pay off seasons later. Yeah. Yeah. There's, that's another thing when you talk about writing a smart show. And I think, I, again, I'll mention the great, cause I do think it's smart. It's written very smartly. Um, is that characters are no, are none of the characters are are all good or all bad, and that mm-hmm. that's you know when you make a character complex, I mean uh, uh, the character that Nicholas Holt plays the emperor. I mean in the beginning, the first several episodes, he's just horrific. He's just like well, he's charming, but he's horrific. But then as you go on, you kind of realize okay, so he's not even though he does some horrible things. He also has a sweetness to him, and so. It's just something to remember when you're right. Like you don't want to make your characters two dimensional, like like cartoon yeah. characters who are just you know evil with their twisting their their mustaches because they're so evil. Like they're everyone in real life. It's the same way. You know, not everyone's all bad. They have good. They have good and bad to them. So yeah, and, that's and, how well, you make it smart. You know, tying it back to like my personal development world. There's this science called neurolinguistic programming. It's been around for a while, and it's how we speak to ourselves. And one of the things that you mm-hmm. have to uncover these things we call presuppositions. And so it's a thing that I believe to be true. I presuppose it. That's where it comes from. And one of those things that you kind of have to internalize and come to terms with is no one is doing anything that is less than ideal. Now, your perspective of what is the what is ideal is different than that person's, which is why they're doing something you wouldn't do, right? Mm-hmm. We all act in a way that benefits us. There we think whether it truly benefits us anymore, there's a belief that it benefits us, and that's why we overeat, that's why we overconsume alcohol, that's why we exercise, mm-hmm. that's why we write. It's because there's a belief of that there's a benefit tied to it. And everyone is doing their best at all times. And one of the best notes I got back, which was very hard to read, I gave a script to someone and he read it. Um, this guy was getting his pilot filmed and he was kind enough to read give me my notes. Give me notes on a script. Mm-hmm. He said, your villain is too villainy. And I was like, oh, you know, basically two-dimensional character. He was just a bad right. guy. There was no good to him. And it was hard to even understand why my protagonist would be with him. The other note mm-hmm. I got off of that was, your or your lead must be a complete idiot if she's with this guy who is this bad. Right? Why would mm-hmm. she be with him that long? This is two-dimensional. You know, I'm reading, or I just finished reading this book by this uh uh, author, author Andre Debus, who I met, had the pleasure of meeting with a few months ago, and the book is called House of, House of Sand and Fog, and it won all these awards, like New York Times bestsellers and all all this stuff. It's, you know, it's a really well written book, and he tells the story, this horrible story of it's a tragedy basically, but it's from told from three different points of view, and um, each time when you're reading the story, it's, it's one event told from different perspectives. And no matter when you're reading one chapter told by that one person, you're rooting for that person. Then you read the next chapter written mm-hmm. by the other person and their perspective, and you're rooting for them. And that's great. That's great writing when you're when the character when you no one is all bad, no one is all good, and you can you're rooting for whoever you're reading for. You know, you're reading, and that's a, I think it's a wonderful example of complex writing, where like mm-hmm. you can everyone has a everyone, you know, everyone has the is the hero of their own story, and everyone thinks they're doing the right thing, but mm-hmm. there's still conflict. Yeah, you know, um, and and another like just getting back to what your your other thing that you said about uh, uh, what was the neuro linguistic programming NLP yeah said. neurolinguistic programming that's something I kind of just hit on I don't know maybe a year or so ago is my friend Miss I don't know if I said this in a pod I probably repeat myself but no one's listening to all these anyway um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe some more I hope you are. Is that my my friend Missy told me this? She said, "What lies are you telling yourself?" Mm-hmm. And I love that. I go, "Oh, that's interesting," because I do tell myself a lot of lies. Anytime you talk about the future, that you're lying. You don't know that what's going to happen. You don't know yeah. if I do. If you do A, B will happen. That's a lie you're telling yourself. You it's don't all know ego. All. It's ego yeah. driving that. And and again, you're tying it back to NLP. It's like you are making the best decision you can and your brain is just trying to solve this problem that it can foresee happening. And so it is taking Mm -hmm. all of the history you've had and projecting it into the future. But that's kind of this principle is we view the world as a projector and that projector is fuzzy or it's not in focus or there's lint on it and it distorts what we see because of all of the things from our past. And so when you can clean that off that you can start seeing things as they truly are. And Truth, you know, 
we talked a little bit about Byron Katie and we talked about um, some other people. Um, oh, excuse me. Who is it? Uh, Brene Burchard. Is that what it is? Uh, not Brene Brene Brown? Brene Brown. Yeah, we talked about Brene Brown. Yeah. And I talked, I think I, I recommended this book, Loving What Is by Byron Katie. Mm-hmm. And she starts with this question that she calls the work. And it's like, what is the story I'm telling myself that's happening right now? Right? Yeah. And um, is this true? And if your answer is not immediately no, the next question is, can you absolutely know that that's true? And you can't absolutely know anything's true. Yeah. And it kind of allows you to kind of see through these stories. And so, you know, as I thought about that with even just the profession of being a writer, it's like, okay, I'm going to be judged for my bad writing. Why? Well, because in the past, someone with good intentions made fun of my writing or tried to dissuade me from being a writer. So that story might prevent me from being a writer. Likewise, we could tie that to our characters, and I think that that might be a level of complexity you can add. Is what what lie is this character telling themselves right now? Yeah, that's motivating yeah. them to take this action. Yeah, yeah. that's that's an interesting. Way, yeah, that's an interesting way of saying what lie. Yeah, for sure. So this ties back to some of the Sundance stuff we talked about, but that's one of the things I saw them do in our um, in the workshops is they would take you know they get thousands of scripts, they read those scripts, they pick five to 10, maybe a dozen people to come attend these workshops. And then they sit down with industry pros for a week and they just help them workshop their script. All of them have read their script. And what's interesting is um, some of these workshops, they would pick like, we want you to work on the grandmother character, which is the side character to the whole story of what's going on. Who Mm -hmm. is she? What was she doing the day before the story started? Why does she matter? And it ends up building those side characters to being these more profound kind of tells that help you understand the world that you're dealing with and why your character is doing what they're doing or infers why they're taking the actions they're doing. And I thought it was a very beautiful lesson to learn about screenwriting is, you know, everyone yeah. has, everyone is, is the hero of their own journey in this story, not just your hero. We might just be following your hero, but everyone else is living their life the best they can and doing what they think is the best. Hi guys, it's Michael Jammin. I wanted to take a break from talking and talk just a little bit more. I think a lot of you people are getting bad advice on the internet. Many of you want to break into the industry as writers or directors or actors, and some of you are paying for this advice on the internet. It's just bad. And as a working TV writer and showrunner, this burns my butt. So my goal is to flush a lot of this bad stuff out of your head and replace it with stuff that's actually going to help you. So I post daily tips on social media. Go follow me, at Michael Jammin Writer. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok. And let's be honest, if you don't have time, like just two minutes a day towards improving your craft, it's not going to happen. So go make it happen for you, at Michael Jammin Writer. Okay, now back to my previous one. You know, this is a little off subject, but it's not really. It's like, you know, we always talk about when you're writing a script that you always want to take your character, put them into new emotional territory, put them into something that they haven't done, because that's interesting. Mm. Um, so like, right, so, so someone who's shy, you put them in front of a camera. That's going to that's gonna be interesting. Um, you know, someone who has, uh, uh, an ang- you know, anger problems, you put them in a situation where they're going to be provoked to be anger, angry, like the Hulk. So... Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but, but that, that whole concept of new emotional territory, I mean, that's something we all need to be doing anyway. There's a great book that I'm, that I just finished reading by this guy named Dr. Joe Dispenza, where he talks about kind of creating the, your new self and through meditation and stuff like that. And it's basically cause every, every decision that you've made, this is what he says. It's like every decision you've made is you're constantly living in the past. Every, you know, if you're thinking of you're going to do something tomorrow, I'll, maybe I'll do this, and you're going to make your decision based on something that's happened to you in the past. And mm-hmm. so, you know, do I take this screenwriting class? Well, last time I took a class, it didn't work out for me, so I'm not going to take this one. Right? Yeah. You know, nothing happened to me. So you're you're literally living in the past, even though you're trying to work into the future. You're making all your decisions based on the past. And so you're never going to change that way because you're always living in the past. You're still so if you really want to become somebody different and reinvent yourself, you have to do things that you would not have done in the mm-hmm. past, or else you're not reinventing yourself. You're still yourself. Yeah. You know this, this beautiful performance coach that I've had, and she's a friend now named Simone Pien. Um, she's been on Celebrity Rehab, friends with Dr. Drew. Some people might know her name. Uh, that was one of the first tasks she gave me is this week I want you to do everything opposite of the way you would normally do it. 
Mm-hmm. That's a hard thing to do. It's hard to just say, oh, well, this morning I would not sleep in, so I'm going to sleep in. Oh, here I would go get a drink of water, so I'm not going to drink water. Here I'm not going to work. I'm going to go work out because normally I wouldn't work out because I'd come up with some yeah. excuse. But it, it helps you kind of see the world from this completely different perspective that is very free. Yeah. Because it's like, yeah, oh, it's freeing. All, all of these things I didn't do is because, I, you know, it's, it's fear of pain. Or it's belief that pleasure will come. And that's kind of what guides our action is I want to run from pain or I want to seek pleasure. And what does this have to do with writing? Um, For me, I think there's two sides to this. And we talked a lot about like the mindset of being a professional writer. And that's something that everyone has to tailor and learn and grow. And the beautiful part, it costs zero money to do that. You just have to invest time and energy, which are free. You have those and you can work on that. But the other side of this kind of ties back to, you know, when I went through a lot of emotional trauma in my early years and I was trying to deal with that, I was, you know, 2008, 9, 10, when I was really getting into screenwriting and really studying, a lot of my writing was very surface level because I had a hard time being emotionally vulnerable. I had a hard Mm -hmm. time kind of dealing with all that negativity. And it wasn't really until I was in an acting class with your wife and Mm -hmm. I had a scene where I was supposed to like... I can't even remember what scene it was, but I was acting against this woman and, and playing, you know, off of her character. And I was having a really hard time connecting. And, um, you know, Jilly, like, she's like, what's going on? Like, what are you feeling? And I couldn't bring it up. And then Cynthia just over here in the corner goes, do you think he's afraid of being intimate? And it was like, holy crap. That, <laughs> ugh. Don't like that answer. But that's totally what it was. I, I had all this fear of being intimate. And, uh, yeah and being vulnerable and that's what was holding me up in every aspect of my life especially in writing so Mm -hmm. but all of our characters are people they're people just like you and me and they're dealing with all of these same things i imagine yeah i mean so to keep it on writing which you have you gave a great example and to keep it on writing you want your characters to do something that they've never done before so you Mm -hmm. should do something you haven't done before make it like you're uncomfortable okay do it and document how you feel in real time in your head. Keep track of how you feel because now you just give it to your, now you use it in your writing later. Yeah. You know? That was something you told me. You, you advice. You gave me advice like when I first moved to LA. It's like, you're a writer. Go do things. You have a license to go do things you mm-hmm. would never do. And every single write-off. one of those influences, <laughs> yeah, every single one of those will be something that influences your writing down the road. Yeah. I, I wrote, uh, I have a collection of, um, personal essays a book i'm working on and um i needed a story i don't think i've talked about this yet but i hope not i needed a story you know i needed a lot of stories <laughs> you need like i need i wanted 21 stories and every time you finish one story like oh that's all i got and um and so i i knew i could probably squeeze another story out of when i lived in spain uh, when i was in college and i and i had a girlfriend and i used to write her all these, you know, letters from, you know, because this is before the internet, so I wouldn't context her or anything. I'd write her letters. And I didn't keep a diary of my time in Spain, but I felt, um, uh, but I, I figured I'd, I probably wrote a lot of this stuff in my letters to her. And so I wanted to call her up. She lives in LA now, not too far from me. I wanted to call her up and say, hey, can I borrow those letters? Because I bet you there's some good stuff in there that I can use for a story, which is an odd thing to do to ask an old girlfriend to read your the old love letter, mm-hmm. right? You know, it's kind of weird. Um, and so I knew, and she was like, sure. So I met, I went to her house and as I was, I was walking in this, I go like, this is strange. This is really loaded. This is a girl that I loved 30 years ago. This is loaded. Keep track of it in your head because this is all good. Yeah. And so I did as I, as I was like, walking to her house she's giving me to her house she's telling about her husband or kids and all that stuff and um and i'm just documenting myself how do i how do i feel now how do i feel now she goes she you know here i have a seat and i'm about to sit on her couch i'm like okay how close do i sit to her do i sit next to her do i sit all the way on the other end is that weird like and all this is great it's just great for the story so i wound up writing writing a story about that only because i did something out of my comfort zone Mm -hmm. you know yeah it's beautiful stuff like this is what it means to be writers you're yeah. ultimately you're helping other people feel something through a medium like through the medium of writing and written word which ultimately becomes photographed and portrayed and the writing plays in every aspect of that and and you know what we, you you just hit on it phil it's like there's a lot of people and yourself included probably 10 15 years ago whatever who have a lot of trouble accessing their feelings mm-hmm. you know 
And so don't take it for granted that just because you're a writer that, oh, everyone else must be able to be, must be able to do this. Like if no. you can do it, you're giving people a gift because a lot of people cannot do it. They cannot mm. go there. They don't want, it's too painful. There's something going on. They don't, they'd rather not. And if you are able to express for them feelings or articulate it in a way that that they don't or can't do, you're giving them a gift if they can't do it for themselves. And and that I think there's a ton of people who can't do that. Oh man, so. there, you know, this is a very personal experience. I, I doubt I've shared it on here. I don't talk about it very much, but you know, I got back from being a missionary. I was a missionary for two years from my church and I got back and I had nothing. I spent all my money to be a missionary. I came back and I was working a job at a deli. I was making 10 bucks an hour. I started managing three other of the delis. Didn't make more money. I was still making 10 bucks an hour. And this was in 2008. And the recession had just hit. And mm-hmm. my about a year later, both of my brothers got off of their missions and they needed help. And so I was using what little money I had to help them. And my brother got really sick. And so instead of paying my car payment, I was paying for my brother to go to the doctor and to go get his medicine and his prescriptions because I just felt this innate need to take care of my family that Mm -hmm. whatever, you know, tied to trauma from being a kid or whatever. Um, But ultimately I was doing this and then I call my bank and I say, hey, I'm not able to make my payment this month right now, but I'll be able to make my payment at the end of the month. I made an arrangement with them. And then my brother was getting married and I decided to I said, okay, I have till the 30th to make this payment. So instead of making it the day, I promise I'll help pay for his honeymoon with my brothers. And we did. And then that Sunday, I got a knock on the door and there was a repo man there. And he was repossessing my car. And it was the most painful moment. I bet. To just yeah. know. And I was so frustrated because I'd kept my word and I, I accept the fact that I had. And I, it's ultimately my fault. But I thought I had, I had till the end of the month. Why would they do it? They're like, well, we didn't trust that you were going to do it. And because everyone was losing their cars, everyone was for losing their homes at this time. The bank was just trying to protect themselves. But I was so frustrated and so hurt and painful. And I just remember I went into my room to avoid the feelings that I was doing. And I put in a film and I had never seen, um, uh, crap, I'm going to forget it. The one with Robin Williams, um, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck wrote it. Um, oh, yeah. Um, uh, oh, it's, man, I'm forgetting. It's the, I can't. Won an Oscar. Yeah, they won an Oscar. Yeah. Anyway, um, anyway, so they're going through a little thing, and Matt Damon's character is like this child prodigy who just understands these things. He's like a savant, and he understands complex math, even though he's never been educated. Goodwill, Goodwill hunting. hunting. We're, bo- we're both Goodwill idiots hunting. for, for yeah. not for not being able to draw that out. But okay, I knew it, sorry, I knew America. It. Goodwill yeah. hunting. Go on. Anyways, go ahead, Phil. So I just remember like I'm sitting there and I'm just tuning out and I'm like not paying attention and I'm not. I'm just, it's, I'm just numbing myself and not having to deal with the situation. And then ultimately like he's sitting there across from Robin Williams and he starts talking about his dad used to beat him with a wrench and Robin Williams mm-hmm. says, it's not your fault. It's not your yeah. fault. And I broke down in tears. Like I want to cry right yep. now because it was like giving me permission to accept that this wasn't my fault. And yeah. did Ben Affleck and Matt Damon know that they were going to affect me then and now like a decade later, 13 years yeah. later? No. But the, because they were able to get there, I was able to get there, and I was able to heal through a random movie that I put in on a bad day, you know. And, yeah, and that's what we get to do as writers. Yeah, yeah. If you're willing to go to that truth, if you're willing to go there, yeah. and not, and you have to be. I did a, I did a post like this a couple of days ago on uh, on TikTok. If you're not following me on Instagram and TikTok, follow me because I got yeah. I got a lot of gems, people. Um, but uh, but I talked about that where it's like this is actually this it's so funny. It's the same girlfriend I, I, I wrote. I sent her. She read one of my stories that I wrote for this collection I'm working on. And then she wrote back a couple of days later. She read it. And she's like, you're so brave to, to do all this, to write this. And then I was like, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not brave to put my feelings into words. That's that's what they required. If you want to be a writer, yeah. that's required. It's not brave. That's the that's the job description. Hmm. It, and I it, it, to be honest, it would be brave of me to write without doing that. Because then I'm turning in crap. And then I'm saying, and I'm handing her, uh, that'd be handing someone here, here's some crap to read. Tell me you like it. Mm-hmm. That's brave. That would be brave because you're setting yourself up for failure. Some audacity, right? Well, it's just like, yeah, you're, I mean, like you're, it's, it's ironic. It's paradoxical. But to be brave, you know, in your writing, you have to be truthful. And, it, you know, if you're not going to, if you're not willing to go there to the truth, then you're really being you're kind of being crazy because you're, you know, yeah. you're setting yourself up for a slap in the face. 
That's you interesting. Know, gonna, they're going to they're going to say, eh, "It's okay. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, it's good." So if you go there, your brain, your brain changes that though. Your brain says, "If I, I if I don't go there, I'm protecting myself." Mm -hmm. Right? But it's the vulnerability. Not if you're a writer, that vulnerability mm -hmm. is key and it's so freeing in every aspect of life. By being yeah. a writer, you are giving permit you're given permission and it is expected of you, I imagine, mm -hmm. to deal with your emotional trauma and problems mm -hmm. because that is the job of being an artist, right? Or a craftsperson. Yeah. You're right. dealing with it. I I gave a copy of uh, some of the stories I wrote to I was I was reluctant to give them to my parents because I was like, ah, what, what am I? I don't want my parents to know this about me. I don't. Want, what are they going to think? And then I was like, eh, who gives a shit? Just <laughs> gives right. a shit. This is my job. <laughs> you know, whether how they take it, how they receive it is on them. I'm just writing the truth. So, um, I, although I'm not hurting them, I don't think, but it's still intimate. It's just you know, being intimate yeah. is difficult for people. So, yeah. How was it received yeah. by your parents? Uh, uh, my my mom. You know, my I think she liked it. It's, she doesn't really talk much about that stuff. My aunt, my aunt read it and she liked it a lot. She loved it. Um, she goes, you know, she said she was laughing out loud a, a lot of times. And she goes, you know, and it, and it gave her a look um, into my life that she hadn't been aware of. These are my, the closest family members. They just don't know these things about me because, you mm -hmm. know, you grow up and you move away and how, they don't know everything. How, how could they? Right. And so you're just sharing this stuff. So, yeah, I mean, if you're on a journey... I get that we're kind of wrapping things up, but if, if there's so many reasons to write and, and they don't include selling a TV show <laughs> or may, or having a movie produced, there are reasons to learn how to writing that don't include making a living at it. And yeah. they're just in terms of like self-expression, getting to know who you are, getting to write, learning how to write in a way that engages other people to give them that gift. So like that, that's why you learn how to write. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, I think um, it's not really a shock to me that one of the most popular sections in your course is personal essays. Like, uh, it was a shock to me. It was a shock to me. I'm glad everyone likes that one, though. Yeah, because yeah. It, it's mining your life for stories. This is what it is. And there's some of the, you know, bonus Q&A stuff you've done with some of the members in there where you talk about how do I look at my life and mine it for examples of things to write about. And that's it's the process of being a writer. So. How do you write a smart show? You make it messy and you make it real is what I'm hearing. You make it yeah, grounded make it, yeah. in reality and things we deal right. with. But when I say messy, it's such a hard word. Like you still have to understand story structure. Like, mm -hmm. you, like that's yeah. the thing. But I still point. think it's like you have to understand the structure and then you just you, – you, that's why I say it's harder to write a neat show than it is to write a messy show. You still have to, in order to be able to, for us to write Marin, which is I think people say is a smart show, we still had to learn how to write the other way, which is neat and maybe not as smart. And so what you do is you write, it's basically you're writing the same show, but you're just pulling out, you're, you're pulling out some details to let the audience draw their own conclusions um, as opposed to kind of spoon feeding them. But either way, we're still, it's so funny, like we still had to break the story the same exact way as we would a network television show. Right. It's just that now we're just, we're just lit. We're not filling in the dots. We're not connecting the dots so, so easily for the audience. We're letting them connect the dots a little more. Which is easier you know? for you to write as a writer. Easier for us to write and harder yeah. for them to watch and because it requires <laughs> them to be more engaged and more, and they go, oh, this is smart writing because you fig because they figured it out. Yeah. So it makes them, you know, it's so interesting what smart how to write smart is you still have to write the same you have to you see you have to have the same amount of training but you just you spoon feed less yeah love yeah. it man well good stuff michael yeah. thank you for another great podcast i think this another be great podcast yeah. yes people if you're going to enjoy our podcast go go in the review section say something kind to phil yeah. leave him a nice <laughs> note say hey phil i believe in you in the in the review section on apple Pod, apple podcast hey phil you're gonna do okay yeah, yeah. Leave Let my, me know. Give them a kind word. Especially after right? my emotional, tra emotionally traumatic memory I just brought up to everybody. Yeah. Say, so, Phil, I hope you get your car back. Stay, yeah. stay, leave them a nice I got note. the car back. I got the car back. <laughs> Don't worry. You got the car back. <laughs> All right. All right, everyone. Thanks Catch so much. Bye-bye.